Berkeley, what you see is all to welcome to the campus of the Donald Hutso, a scholar, an eminent scholar of Buddhism and Bhutan, as well as the founding director of the Lodin Foundation and the Shijun Agency. We would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Karma for finding time from your very busy schedule to visit us and agree to deliver a talk to the RTC community. We are all greatly honored by your presence and I, on behalf of RTC, would like to extend a very warm welcome to you, Lan. Before I ask Dr. Karma to deliver his talk, I will say a few words to introduce him. As some of you may know, Dr. Karma has a very unique background. He was born in Buntang, and after spending some time at Cherry Monastery, he traveled to India, where he trained for nearly 12 years in Buddhist institutes to become a Kempo or a monastic abbot. In addition to being a Kempo, Dr. Karma also holds a master's degree in classical Indian religions and a doctorate in Oriental Studies from Oxford University. It may not surprise you to learn that a theme that runs throughout Dr. Karma's scholarship is the desire to combine Western and traditional Buddhist approaches to knowledge. For example, he has written about the need to combine modern education with traditional education in Bhutan. Recently, Dr. Karma has published two books, one a history of Bhutan and the other an explanation on the Buddhist idea of emptiness. Social engagement is also important to Dr. Karma. He has combined his scholarly interests with hands-on projects. As I mentioned, he is the founding director of the Loden Foundation, an organization that supports education all the way from early learning centers to entrepreneurship training for recent graduates. And most recently, he has helped found the Shejun Agency, a collaborative project to document Bhutan's oral and written culture. Today, we are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Karma here to talk and share his wisdom on a very important subject. The title of his talk is Buddhism, Democracy, and the Disenfranchisement of Religious Persons. I now welcome Dr. Karma to the podium to deliver his address. Thank you, Director, for the wonderful, kind introduction. It's always quite disconcerting to be emphatically introduced as doctor. You know, when I go out into rural parts of Bhutan, I always risk facing a line of sick people to be treated. <laughs> but recently I've discovered that I might actually be a doctor. I was told that I'm a good remedy for insomnia. People who read my book fall asleep very easily. So if you suffer from insomnia, you can try my books. <laughs> Now, another worrying thing that I face as a speaker often, or as a lecturer often, is to address an audience after lunch. And particularly if the audience have a bit too much of a heavy lunch. I myself sitting among the audience would doze off, especially when the talk is on a very serious note, 
that we have chosen for today. Um, but I must say, it's a great honor for me to be here, to be among the series of distinguished speakers you have. I'm neither distinguished nor really a speaker, but I take it as an honor and a privilege to be here to share with you some of the issues that I hold in my heart and think over it or them again and again. So this is what I'm going to do today. I don't have a fully structured, well-written, well-thought-out speech or lecture to give, but I will do a discursive presentation of my opinions on certain issues, and I'll do so in the manner of a classroom, in a more didactic format. And if you don't comprehend me, stop me at any time and ask questions. I thought I'll start from a conversation I had yesterday evening having dinner with a group of tourists from Great Britain. They asked me about two things. One, about how Bhutan is faring with the new democratic system. And two, about the rationale and the reasons for the odd exclusion of religious persons from the election process. Now, my opinion on these two issues, on the first issue particularly, I think was a very reactive one. I liked to challenge their perception of Bhutan. A lot of people in the West think Bhutan is tucked away in some kind of a time warp in a Shangri-La with happy people, innocent, simple people, and now going into a very complicated modern system of democracy. I disagree with that. And I disagree because democracy is a system that has been actually long established in our own mindsets, in our own cultural traditions, even before it has appeared in the West. And I would like to elaborate on this point in order to illustrate how democratic we are actually in our cultural roots. Now, when I talk about cultural roots, we have primarily two sources. One, a pre-Buddhist form, what we call often Bon, although that's a misnomer, it's not quite appropriate to call our localized ancient pre-Buddhist rituals Bon. The other is the more structured institutional religious tradition that we know as Buddhism, that has been with us for over a thousand years and has really informed our way of living, has shaped our way of thinking, way of speaking, way of behavior, our whole life. So I'd like to go back to Buddhism and really explain to you my understanding of how it has actually made us very democratic in our very deep cultural roots. Are you with me? Yes. Um, if I speak faster or slower, let me know. Buddhism started in India, as you all know, but at a time, which probably not all of you know, when there was a lot of cultural, sorry, a lot of spiritual inquiry and spiritual quest going on, and also a lot of reactionary work. And Buddha was one such thinker, one such spiritual man who wanted to challenge established systems and find a new solution to the problems of life. And he did so by challenging some of the existing beliefs. And one of them included the belief that we are lower than a higher being, that we are not totally free, that the ancient world, all the ancient beings, are creations of a higher, greater creator. Buddha didn't quite like that idea of being unequal to someone or something. So his reaction to that established Brahmanical theist system, the system with the belief in a creator, in a God, was to 
defy the creator, to go for a system where you are your own creator, not somebody else, divine or otherwise, out there. So he founded a new system where in there is no external or internal person or individual who had a higher power or authority to control you. When the Buddha explained how the world came about, I'm sure you all know that, he would say the world, or rebirth, the sufferings, the happiness that we experience is an outcome of our own actions. And the actions come from emotions. And then the emotions he further traced back to the sense of the I, the mistaken notion of the I or the ego. So his explanation was that we actually are our own creators. We bring about our existence through our own state of mind, through our own emotions, through our own uh, actions. He went beyond the existing religious traditions of his day to promote, to bring, to start a system where everybody actually were equal in being their own creators, in, in crafting, in making their own existence. So theologically speaking, this is how Buddhism starts. Buddhism goes with this spirit of total freedom and equality. And the same can be said about the Buddhist theory of morality. Now, in some religions, good and bad is determined by a scripture or by an authoritative book that is supposed to have come down from a God figure. In some systems, good and bad is distinguished by some secular power, for instance. In the same way, you have also good and bad based on the inherent nature of actions. Some actions are considered intrinsically good, some actions intrinsically bad. So there are many kinds of moral philosophies. The Buddha went for a, a moral philosophy that is volitional, that is based on voluntarism. It is the quality of the intentions, of the volitions, of the thoughts inside that distinguish good from bad, pure from impure. So he again argued that a person, a great person or a good person, a poor person or a bad person is not defined by someone's status in society, someone's birth in society. And again, he was going against some very established social, social forces, such as casteism. The caste system in Buddha's days was very strong. And he brought in this new idea that it's not really your birth that makes you a Brahmin or a Shudra but it's really your, the quality of the state of your mind, your intention, your own motivation, and the actions that follow those motivations that make you a Brahmin or a Shudra. So you find quite a lot of verses in this book called the Dharmapada. Have any one of you read the Dharmapada? Shuiki Sik Sucheba? You have. That's great. Because the Dharmapada is in many ways the gist of the Buddha's teachings. The Buddhists don't have, like other religious traditions, a single book to show to represent the religious tradition. And the Dharmapada is the closest we can get to a Buddhist Bible. Okay, so in that book, which is basically a compilation of many asthmatic, very effective verses from the Buddha's times, you find this emphasis, a whole chapter dedicated to who is a true Brahmin. The Brahmin is not defined by the cloth that somebody or clothes that someone wears, not by the matted hair, not by the birth, not by the recitation of Vedas. It's not really the physical or the verbal or the social roles and the appearances, but the quality of the mind that distinguishes somebody as higher, somebody as more morally superior. So the Buddha challenged social systems which were unequal, which promoted inequality among different castes, 
from among sexes, among uh, classes. He actually was propagating a system where everyone should be treated equally and given equal opportunities. And his fundamental theory is that the value of a person, the um, worth of a person, should be measured through the good actions and the good thoughts a person has. So if someone has fantastic thoughts, say an altruistic mind, a champagne is saying, then that person is certainly superior than even those who are born as Brahmins or kings or so forth. So it's not so much birth or uh, external appearances, but the internal state of the mind. And that state of the mind, the Buddha easily pointed out, emphasized, is a free asset that we all have. There's not one person who doesn't have a mind. So we are all given the equal opportunities to either become great or small. We are given the equal opportunity to become very good as well as very bad. So you can see how very democratic and egalitarian the whole Buddhist system is from these perspectives. And now if you look at what Buddhism really is for, the Buddha didn't really develop a religious tradition to make things better in this world. Of course, that is one of the objectives. But the main objective for his discovery of a new system, a new, his introduction of a new religious tradition, was to actually see things beyond this world, beyond this life. You know, so even if you ask our parents in the villages, they care more about what comes next, or what comes after this life, than what happens in this life. You ask someone, going on the stupa, most of them will tell that they're doing the prayers or rituals for a better rebirth. So the Buddha's main mission was also to take people out of what he saw as this sea of suffering, this samsara, to a higher goal, a place or a state where you have much longer lasting happiness, where you have much better sort of state of mind the state of liberation, or nirvana. So now, I don't know if you have noticed the word liberation, tarpa, moksha. This is what is the ultimate, the eventual goal for the whole Buddhist endeavor. And what is it about? It's to be free. Liberation is to be free. To escape all kinds of bondages. And bondages come in different forms. Of course, there are emotional bondages, like being gripped with attachment and hatred and ignorance and so forth. And those bondages are much more serious. There are other bondages that are social. Somebody being socially op oppressed, politically oppressed. Buddhism is all about taking someone out of such oppression, beyond such oppression to a totally free, independent state. So you can see even from a soteriological point of view, and I have have you heard this word soteriology? No. S O T E R I O L O G Y. It's a word that I picked up after uh, getting into Oxford. Soteriology is a vocabulary that's preferred over sal uh, theory of salvation. The salvation has a very Christian connotation. So when scholars study other religions and other religious theories of salvation, they call it soteriology, the study of path to salvation or enlightenment. So in Buddhist soteriology, the ultimate goal is really liberation. And the worst kind of bondage is your ignorance. So Buddhism is very much an educational program to expand and extend your mind power to fully liberate your mind from the obscurations, from the uh, ignorance that envelops it and liberate it totally into a state of openness. So you can see how Buddhism is, from the perspective of it being a spiritual path, as a, an effort aimed at liberation and reaching a totally free state. Then if you, for instance, look at, <coughs> now let me ask you a question. Now the Buddha 
put so much emphasis on freedom and equality. We all put so much freedom and equality. Why do you think is this needed? Why is it so? As young people, I'm sure you keep asking yourself such questions. Why do you like freedom? Because freedom comes with responsibility. <laughs> well, if no one is answering, um, I think, and of course most of the Buddhist teachers will say the same thing, we like freedom, we like equality, because we are by nature free. We are by nature equal. This is what the Buddha argues. You take, for instance, me and, say, you. The Buddha's argument is that on an emotional level, on a, what the Buddhists call the conventional level, on the level of worldly transactions, I like happiness, I like pleasure. And so do you. So we are equal in that sense, that we have same likes, same dislikes. Although you might like rock music and I like classical Bhutanese music, but we like what is pleasant to our ears or to our mind. We dislike things that displeases us. So we are like in liking happiness. We are similar in liking happiness. We are dis uh, similar in disliking unhappiness. So the Buddha basically argues that on an emotional, empirical level, we have this kind of equality. We are all equal in this respect. And a lot of the Buddhist moral and ethical uh, theories are based on this equality. And then, if you ask about my being, you know, who I am and who you are, the answer is again that we are all the same that I am here this cluster of my body and my mind. What is often put as the psychosomatic combination, the psychological and the somatic elements or parts being put together to be called karma. When I leave this body, I will lose this identity of being karma. Then, the same applies to you. You try to reduce yourself to deconstruct yourself, you are also a combination of your physical and psychological components. So just as I am a combination of so many different psychosomatic parts, you are also a combination of such psychosomatic parts. In fact, if you go deeper, it's very much the same argument that modern biologists use, that you are a cluster of cells, I am a cluster of cells, there is very little that you can distinguish. If we have some kind of a modern machine to put us together, if, say, your cell and my cell are being juxtaposed, there's no way anyone could tell that this is karma cell and this is an RTC faculty cell. So the Buddha's argument that was that even in our own, in our being, in our state of existence, we are all the same, that we are totally equal. So the Mahayana form of Buddhism, which we are supposed to be following, takes it even further and says, we are all inherently liberated, inherently enlightened, that we have the Buddha nature within us. It's just a matter of opening up, of bringing out, of manifesting the latent qualities in us. So there is this theory of rochik, you know, one taste, single taste of oneness, equality. These theories, more or less underpin our way of life, our outlook. You know? It's the, the philosophies that are embedded in the Buddhist tradition talk about fundamental equality and sameness of all people. So um, through these, I would say that the Buddhist tradition is, it comes with a very profound philosophical arguments for democratic ideas of being equal, of being free, of having equal rights, and so forth. And it is these ideas that inform the cultural practices that we have in the country that manifest in different ways. For instance, in a monastery, have you ever visited a monastery uh, during Yagne, summer retreat? No. Now, on an issue like Yagne, the monks have to go to uh, verbs. So 
if it is done as per the rule, as per the theory, the monks are made to vote in choice of the venue for the summer retreat, in choice of the head during the summer retreat. And it has to be a consensual agreement, not just a majority. You don't win just by a majority. In the monastic tradition, if it's done according to the theory, you have to get a 100% agreement on whether the monks want to have the summer retreat in Tango or not. They might say, we'll have it in Cherry. So if there's anybody who disagrees, the um, conclusion is nullified. So they have to, they have to get full 100% the agreement on such a thing. So it manifests in some different Buddhist practices, the inherent Buddhist philosophy of equality and um, freedom is expressed through so many different uh, practices. In fact, I actually find it quite interesting. In our modern system of uh, elections, you go to caste vote. You more or less throw a ballot into a box or push the button, so you're casting a vote. But in the monastic Buddhist tradition, you actually pick a vote. So you know, you first have a vote bank. So all the eligible voters are counted. And then people are asked to pick their vote if they agree. And whatever is left would mean those who didn't agree and those who were absentees. So it's, it's just a minor uh, diversion of how you could perceive casting a vote in a modern uh, practice and of picking or collecting your votes in an ancient Buddhist tradition. It's called Tsulshin, if, if any one of you are interested, um, is interested in pursuing it further. Tsulshin Nang, to pick up, collect the Tsulshin. That's the vote. So, now having said this, I personally believe that the Bhutanese cultural tradition has a very well-founded democratic base that we are not new to the idea of equality and we are not new to the idea of freedom and you see that a lot even in how the villages go about running their systems through village meetings in the traditional context I'm not talking about the modern uh, governmental institutions or organizations but in the traditional village system and that's why, coming back to my conversation with the uh, tourists last night, I challenged their perception and said that what a lot of the Westerners come here is they come with a sense of Orientalism. They see Bhutan as this very innocent, happy, simple country and overlook the fact that we already have a very well-founded, systematic uh, philosophy and practice of democracy. But one cannot, of course, uh, ignore the fact that the modern system of electing a government through a secret ballot is certainly new to Bhutan. When we adopted this, I fear that perhaps we made a slight misjudgment of our own cultural tradition, of our own philosophical and cultural background, to go in a way that's totally biased towards the modern Western system and totally biased against our own cultural system. And those very distinctly show in the two election laws that we know of. One, that requires the candidate for the parliament to have a university degree. And two, one that excludes the religious persons from the electoral process. Now, on the first issue, I wouldn't elaborate much, but it is sad that the whole educational system in Bhutan is biased against the traditional form of education. In fact, I myself, I'm quite regretful and almost sound hypocritical that I'm doing all this talk in English, uh, whereas I could have done a lot better with the Bhutanese audience, at least in Zongkhao or some other Bhutanese languages. But because of the presence of the international faculty and members here, I perhaps can forgive myself. Um, so, the education system on the whole has really gone in favor of the modern system, the modern secular scientific Western system that we see in so many different ways, not only in your classrooms, but even in how the government deals with the outcomes of education. 
if I always quote this example, if for instance we have an architect who has spent all his life building farmhouses and even dorms, and then if you have a modern graduate from India who has not even built a hut, but has learned theories of architecture within the classroom walls, and if they go to this Timpo City Corporation to be um, signatories to a, a building plan, the traditional architect, of course, is disqualified. The architect does, is, doesn't have the certificate to get that license to be a qualified architect. So this is how biased it is. And in the same way, if you look at the education system, in the traditional form, you have this very focused form of education that you have the master, the elder who guides the younger, the apprentice, giving a great deal of, a great deal of attention and um, catering to the needs of the, the people. This is something that we find in Oxford and Cambridge, where I uh, lived for, for 13 years. They have a system called the tutorial system. Very expensive, but this is the pride of the Oxbridge colleges. They think that they do much better than other universities because they provide this specialized tuition to the students, almost one-to-one. -one. It can be one to two or three, but not certainly mass education. So. The traditional form of Bhutanese education is very much like the tutorial system where the guru or the elder guides the people step by step in a very personalized way. We totally throw it out and we go for a mass education done in huge groups and a paper certificate that comes afterwards. Um, a lot of them, especially from outside Bhutan, come in with very little quality. Uh, and that paper, that piece of paper counts as a university degree and is a token of successful education and therefore you can stand for elections whereas a village elder who has spent all his life knowing the reality on the ground, knowing the problems and the difficulties of the people cannot qualify for elections. So you can now very clearly see the huge bias and perhaps there is a vested interest in having these policies. Now I don't know how much time I have Um, I would like to talk about, a little about the second bias, the exclusion of the religious persons, which I find is atrocious, because one can really understand the religious persons not being allowed to stand, not being allowed to campaign, just as civil servants are not allowed, to be a partisan, but to deprive them of their fundamental right to vote, which is enshrined in our constitution, is a total slap on the face of Bhutanese tradition, Bhutanese constitution, and the dignity of a human being. I'm sure you have read the constitution, most of you. Article 7 and clause 6, I will read out here, I have it in front of me, says, well, a Bhutanese citizen shall have the right to vote. Simple. A very clear statement. And why haven't we not practiced it? And I find it particularly intriguing when you look at, the, look at this issue from various aspects. Look at it from a historical perspective. Bhutan was founded. I'm sure you all know. Bhutan was founded by a religious person. You cannot forget that. Shabdrung was a lama, a leader of a monastic establishment, and he founded Bhutan as a religious state. He went into great difficulties, to great troubles, to fend off external enemies, to win internal allies, and he used a great deal of religious practice, in fact, to build Bhutan. If you read the Bhutan history, you would know that to a great extent, the Bhutanese always attributed our religious persons for doing the rituals right to defeat the Tibetan invaders or the British invaders. And even as recent as the Alpargoro issue we had in the East, people generally believe that it's because of the forces the power of the deities on the side of Bhutan. 
the religious forces. So Bhutan really started through religious figures, through the efforts of religious persons. Then look at what transpired after that. For about 60% of our history, Bhutan was ruled by religious persons, by monks, basically. Most of the early rulers of Bhutan were monks. Then even now, whenever we talk about the kings, we refer to them as Chugyet, religious kings. I think it is ridiculous that religious persons should be excluded from such an important role of nation building, of protecting the sovereignty of the kingdom, of electing the government that will run the country for at least five years. So, historically speaking, we know that Bhutan was founded, run, and still being run by religious persons. Now, if you look at, look at it from a cultural perspective, in the villages, if you want to build a house, the first person the villager consults is a village chok, a religious person, on the date, on the venue, on the uh, rituals. You want to start a business, the first person most Bhutanese consult is a religious person. So almost in all the aspects of Bhutanese life, we consult religious persons. But on one very important decision that matters for the country, we kick all the religious persons out. We exclude them and decide to make the decision without them, let alone seek their advice. Think about it from a social perspective. In places like Gangte, where I've worked in the temple briefly, digitizing manuscripts, half of the householders are religious priests. They're gongchens. Now, okay, monks, you can say, they live in the monasteries, in the hermitages, and don't really have much to do or say in the real life of the people in the villages and communities. But when you look at like a community like Gangte, half of the village elders, half of the decision-making villagers are religious persons. The same applies also to my village, Ura. Half of the village men are gongchens. You exclude them from making a decision that is vital for the welfare of the village, what do you expect? Of course, a very partial decision, a decision that's not informed by the needs and the realities of the community. And then look at it from a political perspective. A law for political process ought to at least serve the political purpose. But when you look at this regulation from a political perspective, it is totally counterproductive. First, it flies straight against the constitution which it is supposed to support. Then, when democracy came into Bhutan, we would really like to have a vibrant, healthy democracy. Even the democracy of electing a government. Of course, the democratic principles are quite deeply ingrained in the Bhutanese tradition. But the new tradition of electing a government, we would have wished to have a very good, healthy one. But what happened? With the exclusion of non-university graduates from competing, with the exclusion of the religious persons, we have narrowed down the choice of leaders. None of the leaders who didn't have university certificates could take part in it. And then none of the religious persons could really um, help the process, help so invigorate it by participating in it. In many Western countries where I have been, I've lived in France, I've lived in the UK, and sometime in the US, there is something called political or voters' apathy. Less and less people take interest in politics. They go about their own businesses and don't bother to go to elections. Sometimes during a UK election, you might have 40% of the electorate casting their votes. That's a very bad sign because you want a common decision to be made by as many people 
who have stakes in it. In Bhutan, we could have done it differently. We know during the first election, of course, about 80% or nearly 80% took part in the main elections. It was far less this time. But the fact that we have regulations such as these, ex excluding people from the electoral process, only leads on to add to the problem of political or voters' apathy. So instead of building a vibrant participatory democracy, we stifle it right from the start. Now, the most serious worry for me is exactly the explanation, the rationale, the excuse, I call it, they have given for the exclusion of religious persons. The argument is religion must remain above politics. Please remember that. Religion must remain above politics. And two, monks should not get into discrimination. It's a very artificial segregation of human life, if you carefully look at it. You can have said this is karma's religious aspect and this is karma's political aspect. In a human existence, as an individual, we have our political roles and duties. We have our religious roles and duties. We have our social roles and duties. I can be a family man one, uh, in one way, an academic or a professional person in another way. I can, I'm basically a cluster of so many different identities, as the Buddha has said. There's no one me. So to draw an artificial line, saying religion is above, politics below, is itself a very nonsensical idea. And then, we don't normally sort of put religion up somewhere as a holy and sacred thing removed from our lives. The whole purpose of religion is lost then. Religion is something that we need to live by every moment of our life. Religious principles ought to inspire us, all of us, and particularly the politicians. So you cannot segregate the religious life of an MP from the political life of an MP. If you segregate that, you might probably get a totally ruthless, immoral politician. Because to a large extent, people are made good through moral and religious intervention. And then, there's a fundamental misconception, terrible misconception about discrimination and democracy. And really want you young people to understand this, even if you didn't understand anything that I said so far. <laughs> democracy, okay, let me pose this question again back to you. What do you make of democracy? Can I ask someone specific, maybe the young man here in Mata? Or if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. But what do you think is democracy? Any volunteer? Someone in the back? No, you ought to tell me, not among yourselves. <laughs> no volunteer. But I'll tell you, I'll share with you what I've found as a researcher. I travel across the country as a researcher trying to understand the people in Bhutan. And lots of people think democracy equals to going to cast your vote for electing a government. That's a pathetic, narrow perception of democracy. We've already heard, uh, discussed earlier of how democracy is about freedom and rights, about equality as foundation principles for our life. Democracy is beyond the electoral process. Democracy is about having opportunities to succeed in a college if you are successful, if you're good. Democracy is about giving the getting the right job if you have the right skills. So it should go beyond the electoral process. So young men and women think of democracy in all aspects of life, not just during the short period of electing a government. More importantly, when you think of democracy, don't only think of your rights. You must, okay, I say you must, think of your responsibilities as well. So democracy is about claiming the rights and equally 
shouldering the responsibilities. If you want to have your democratic right to play your own blasting uh, rap music at night, you must also have the responsibility not to disturb your neighbor who is preparing for his or her final exam. You got that? Okay, so it is very important for you to realize that democracy is much bigger than the electoral process and it comes with both rights and responsibilities. Now, what our state to an extent and the election commission to a large extent has done is they went on to argue that democracy involves discrimination. Democracy is about party politics. That's a very narrow, biased understanding of democracy. Party politics matter, but that's not the end. That's not all that democracy has to offer. So, when we talk about discrimination, that monks should be above discrimination. Let me give you this information. Discrimination is a good thing to have, as long as you have the right kind of discrimination. What do you get by the English word discrimination? There are at least two things that you can get from it, especially seeing it from a Buddhist perspective. There's good discrimination, which in the Buddhist text you find as Dharma Bibanga Pagna. That's a Sanskrit term. In Chukki it is Chhe Raptu Nambar JB Sherap. Sherap Namji Ki Sherap is often called. The discrimination to distinguish what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. We all must have discrimination to be able to tell what is white from black, what is good from bad, what is right from wrong. So the faculty of discrimination often put in uh, Buddhism as Shirap to number Jibi Shirap. The Shirap, the faculty, the intelligence, which can discriminate the dharmas, the existence, the phenomena. It is fundamental for Buddhist practice. It is fundamental for a proper, uh, regular, smooth running of a society. It's basically our faculty, our capability to discern good from bad, right from wrong. So, discrimination is not something Buddhism is against. It is the pillar, the central pillar of the whole Buddhist practice. You need discrimination. Discrimination does not have to refer to bickering and quarreling and mudslinging and sort of being one-sided and biased. So that kind of discrimination, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, um, caste discrimination, all that sort of discrimination which comes in the Chike or Zongkha vocabulary as Chagbang Chori, that is to be shunned. So we fully understand such discrimination is not healthy for democracy, such discrimination is not healthy for society as a whole. But is democracy about such discrimination? The second kind of discrimination? I would say no. Democracy is not about taking sides. It's not about belonging to one party and hating the other. It's not about mudslinging and quarreling all the time. Democracy is about the first kind of discrimination, about knowing who will make a better leader, who will make a better government, and then exercising your right to elect that, to choose that. So it is totally against Buddhism to say that monks should be above discrimination. Monks should be deeply into the right kind of discrimination. And no one should be into the wrong kind of discrimination. So it is so sad when you hear leaders, some officials saying democracy is about discrimination and monks should keep away from it. That is not the democracy we want to have. We want to have a democracy with a sound judgment, with a right sense of discrimination, not all about taking sides and quarreling with each other. So, what I want to tell here is that the whole explanation they give about religion being above politics, the monks requiring to be away from discrimination is a bogus argument, that it doesn't hold water if you carefully look into it. 
And with that, I will uh, conclude, urging you to think about this, to ponder in it, to, to voice it more, to talk about it, because I think it is, again, a democratic responsibility for us to voice, or to be voice, to be an advocate for those who are voiceless, and especially those groups that are marginalized, that are downtrodden, that are discriminated against. I don't mean to propose here as a clarification that monks should come into politics as candidates. Don't mean to propose here that monks should start campaigning. But monks should have the right to the fundamental human right to vote in electing their government. And it is their responsibility as well to care for the country by electing the right kind of government. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Hello, sir. I'm Kunzan Dima, PA Shidiya's third year. Uh, my question is, why do you think the religious group are being barred from voting rights, other than the superficial excuse of religion being superior to politics? Is it due to the fear of time being ruled by monks again? That's it, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I honestly don't have an answer. Uh, I'm not yet a, a realized person with clairvoyance to read uh, what goes in the minds of the leaders or in the minds of those who have uh, endorsed the, the legislation for reading months from voting. Someone told me that it might be because of advice from India. India being a good case for religious fundamentalism creeping into politics. So one must acknowledge that if religion is brought into the political space uh, openly, allowing monks to, to campaign, allowing monks to openly declare their political uh, opinions and uh, uh, partnerships, their loyalty to the parties, then it could lead to a great deal of influence coming from the religious figures onto a very pious, devo devoted electorate. So one must definitely be careful about such influences because religious figures, as we all know, are highly influential among particularly our rural electorate. So it could be true, what I heard could be true, that India advised Bhutan to exclude religious persons from politics. But I still feel it's going too far to deny them the right to vote. They could have been treated exactly the way the election commission treats the civil servants. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor, for your very strong argument, actually. <laughs> I do remember once asking our uh, election chief commission about, uh, about the monks being deprived with their voting rights. And, uh, I, and then I totally remember he telling me that it could be done due to proper consultation with the Hmong Bodhisattva. So now what I actually wanted to know is, I wanted to ask where the Hmong Bodhis actually consulted about this when they actually drafted the constitution. Good. I can be clear on one point, that the monks were involved in the drafting of the constitution. There were a few monastic representatives. And that's probably the reason why the constitution says a Bhutanese shall have the right to vote. But I don't know if any monastic authorities or persons were consulted in drafting the legislations 
the election laws which prohibit them from casting their vote. So we have to make a clear distinction here. The constitution doesn't prohibit religious persons from taking part in the elections. It's the election laws that prohibit them and goes against the constitution as well. Share your opinion uh, if they should have a say in the electoral process, and have there been any movements to change it? Thank you very much. Uh, this was a question that I thought uh, uh, I would love to answer <laughs> if you asked. Um, there are some monks who are very happy with the current status of things. There are some monks who are happy that monks don't have to get embroiled into politics. But there are other monks, especially the Gomchens. Now, I don't normally use the word monks for them, but they are religious persons who are listed as those prohibited against, uh, prohibited from voting. Now, my personal opinion on this is that a religious tradition like Buddhism which I told you earlier, has its primary objective of reaching enlightenment and liberation, ought to still work for the betterment of the society, the visible society, the society that we live in. There are lots of escapist monks who run away from the society to live a very individualistic, a very uh, secluded life for themselves. I don't blame them if they really don't have the, the interest to live in the world, to do anything good to the world. At least they can remain in the remote uh, hermitages and make good prayers for the world. So that still counts as something. But that is still quite an inferior or a lower category of religious persons. If you look at it or at them from a higher perspective of Mahayana Buddhism and of Bodhisattva ethics. If you want to be a serious Bodhisattva or Mahayana practitioner, you ought to actually engage in the world, to live in the world, to help it. Of course, if you don't have the willpower, you may for a short period go into the hermitage or into a monastery and develop your inner strength. Because you do need the inner strength and willpower to be able to engage with the world. Or otherwise you're going to easily get frightened and uh, disappointed with it and may even become worse, a, a lot worse person. But on the whole, if you have that internal capacity to work with the world, to engage in it, then it is your duty as a religious person, as a Buddhist monk, to engage with the world. And this is something that is very important in Mahayana Buddhism. Maybe in earlier form of Buddhism where Monasticism was very important. A reclusive life was what was uh, was uh, emphasized, what was the main focus. But with the Buddhist tradition we have here in Bhutan, monks, if they are able, must engage with the world, must bring about changes that benefit the greater society. And uh, I argue with monks that Buddhism, particularly Mahayana Buddhism, is not all about going to the hermitages or going to the monasteries. It's really about engaging with the real problems in the society. And by that logic, I would say monks must also learn how to engage with the uh, people. They must learn how to exercise their uh, uh, democratic rights and really exercise it. In some parts of the world, you have a new brand of Buddhism being called engaged Buddhist. And uh, I think this is what Bhutan should also have more. So the short answer is there are some monks who are happy that they don't have to get involved, and there are some monks who are not happy that they cannot get involved. But even when you look at it from their personal perspective, 
those who don't want to get involved can always stay away from it, if, even if the prohibition is lifted. A lot of us didn't go to vote. Well, we didn't get 100% uh, votes. So that means a large chunk of eligible voters didn't take part in it. So the monks, if they don't want to take part in it, can always leave it. But those who want to take part in it must be encouraged, must have the freedom and the right to do so. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tarab from the First Year Political Science Sociology. So this is not really a question, but you know, just a clarification. I just wanted to know your view now. Uh, I'm not an expert on religion, but... A basic understanding of Buddhism is that, you know, we should be enlightened and make correct decisions, be compassionate. And uh, Bhutan being known for, you know, as a Mahayana, the only Mahayana uh, country in the world, in the future, I'll just like to know if it would be very wise to have uh, the religious body being able to vote because, you know, they should be more compassionate, more understanding and, you know, their views and uh, their ideas should be beneficial to all. So in the future, my uh, question is, do you think that it would be a good idea to have them vote and plus uh, a large number of uh, eligible voters are also in the monk bodies now? Thank you. Uh, that's again uh, one additional point. <laughs> A point that uh, I have forgotten to mention earlier, uh, especially while comparing the two systems of education. If you look at the monastic traditional form of education, a large chunk, well, actually not just a large chunk, I would say the vast majority of the content of education is on character building, on developing wisdom, on de developing compassion. It's really in making that person a better citizen, a better person. It's not a focused on technical skills, on vocational skills. So monks don't know how to, for instance, uh, repair a car. They are not trained as mechanics. They're not trained as medics. But they are definitely trained in the art of training the mind in the art of disciplining the person, in the art of character building. So the whole traditional education system is driven towards developing wisdom, that faculty to discriminate wisely that I mentioned earlier. And that's why I find it such an irony that this whole group of people who are very wise, who, who had education that focused on making the right judgment, the right decision, are excluded from the most important decision that the nation has to make. So it's really a waste of wisdom and compassion that the monastic uh, uh, community has, which we can't use in this process of electing the government. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank, thank doctor for coming here. And we are very much privileged honor, and honored to have you here. And my question is, um, so most of us are taught that all religions follow the same path, that is to achieve the liberation at the end. However, there are many issues that I have come across, like conversism and religion. Therefore, my question is, what is your opinion on, on those issues, like conversion of religion? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that's really relevant to our times because we are now living in a highly globalized world with a great deal of exposure to multiple or numerous religious traditions. And uh, I think I can probably give you this, uh, give an answer to this by uh, going back to the Buddhist wisdom. The Buddha has often liked to present his system with a, a metaphor of medicine. People are like ill persons. They have terrible problems, but they don't have the same problem. So people come with a wide range of problems, wide range of temperaments, wide range of intellectual caliber, wide range of dispositions. 
Now, in order to treat effectively such a wide range of people, you also need to adopt a wide range of remedies. There's no one single remedy to treat all illnesses. So the Buddha often came up with different spiritual religious solutions to different problems of different people. And that's why we have this vast range of teachings, immense diversity of religious practices. And I think this can be applied also to the world religions. People come with different interests, different aspirations. For some, Himalayan Buddhist tradition may work. For others, the Chinese Buddhist tradition and the Theravada Buddhist traditions may work. And yet, for others, Christianity may work better. So it's really a matter of what works best for oneself. And perhaps the conversions happen because their previous faith didn't work for them. Now, I'm not a, a, a promoter of one religion as the only true authentic religion. So I would happily claim that Buddhism works for me. But I wouldn't want to impose the Buddhism that works on me onto somebody else for whom maybe Islam works better. So I think it's with such openness, with that kind of Buddhist spirit, that we should look at the world religions and the various conversions that happen. Did I answer you? Dr. Karma, once again, for coming to speak to us all about uh, the role of religion in politics in Bhutan, about Buddhist ethics, um, and also about the value of local knowledge. Um, I'd like to emphasize one thing that he touched upon, which was this very Buddhist notion of wisdom and compassionate action being connected. Um, and that another way of saying this would be that what we learn ought to affect our way of being in the world. Now, I think. You mentioned monks finding escapism. I think there are many forms of escapism, even in lay life. Um, and I'd like you all to reflect maybe on how your own education here at RTC is not only about conveying knowledge, but also about trying to help you all to find ways to be more humane, to be more curious, and to possibly also be more engaged in the world around you. Thank you, Dr. Kama. As a token of gratitude for this um, platform that you gave me, I want to contribute two copies of my PhD dissertation, which I wrote for Oxford, and which has recently been published here in its second edition by Riam Books, and I would leave, like to leave two copies of this in your library, in case anyone of you wants to um, see what, what this, big, this thick book on emptiness is about. 